Uh, did I lose anybody else? Um, I, I don't they... think so. I think they may have moved one more off. I'm not remaining. too sure. I'll have to confirm that for you if I if I get the chance to. But Five for Hot Stick, the remaining. last games I actually casted of these guys, they do work very well as a team. They've got Reserve lots of synergy time. going in together. They love to play aggressive. That is the major. Um, that's the major thing when you look at both. MVP teams, they both love playing hyper-aggressive Dota, so expect a lot of aggression from them. They do come to issues where sometimes they become too aggressive, and they mm. give too much away to the enemy, so I think depending on what kind of draft that they're going, if they can find the solid draft that should not run into that issue, then I think for Hot 6, they should have a relatively easy game, but if they do have a small a window of opening for Team Redemption to maybe overtake them, if they do I, I suppose it mess up yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll see what they end up bringing to the table here. Um, it's going to be a curious one indeed, as we do end up seeing the Undying picked up, as well as the Bounty Hunter, and again into position now. Uh, Ember Spirit also going to be banned out, as well as the Juggernaut, Gyrocopter, and the Dazzle. You know, I'm a little bit surprised to see the Bounty Hunter picked up here. It's not something that you would normally expect, considering there is, you know, a, a lot of team fight potential that comes out from the Darkseer and Winter Wyvern, so a little bit of an interesting combo there. Um, obviously, the hero is great for being able to have catch-up potential and this is something that the Darkseer Winter Wyvern are always going to be giving you but it looks like maybe they're leaning or pushing a little bit more towards the late game and I kind of like the PL pick here as well it's going to be a great way to counter out that Untying Tombstone and it also gives you an opportunity to scale well into the late game and uh, while Shadow Fiend is always going to be relevant and always going to be able to do a lot of damage very quickly you need to be able to keep your eye on this PL because if he starts getting up those items the Scotty starts getting up eventually down the line you know the Manta, even a heart later on, he's going to be nigh unkillable, and they don't have a ton of ways to deal with him right now. You take a look, Bane, incredibly single target focused. Shadow Fiend, while he does have elements of being able to do a lot of damage, a lot of, in terms of an AoE, a lot of that damage is magical in an AoE, and his right clicks are still single target. So they need some other way to be able to do it, maybe just identifying which hero is the real PL in the middle of all of that scrum is going to be the right answer, but I like the, also the ban here of the Sven. Absolutely, but the thing is with Hot 6's draft, you look at these heroes and they're so early game oriented, so you're looking at Hot 6 and they're thinking, we want to fight very, very early. We want to fight before the Bounty Hunter track gold really kicks in. We want to fight before the PL. Well, actually, never mind. anti Mage just completely throws my theory out the window. But they do have a very strong 4, uh, four Protect 1 lineup, and anti Mage also does very well up against the Phantom Lands, so actually scaling better in the late game scenario. So it looks like for the moment, both teams are looking into going for aggressive styles of play. They want to actually fight the other team to delay it for their own carry. I think the problem here with Redemption is that you pick a bounty hunter, and what does that hero excel at the most? He excels at single uh, single target remaining. pick offs. Or if he, at least you can just sort of peel heroes off and get those track Five kills. But you look at Hot Six, does it look like they want to separate? I, I honestly don't think you're going to find Bane, Shadow Fiend, Result. Undying, and Night Stalker separating once they get their, their levels and items. Anti Mage, maybe. But the lockdown's not there for redemption. How do mm -hmm. they deal with this anti-mage? I, I think that it was the perfect pick for them at this point. They're also mm -hmm. going to have that extended, you know, team fight or not team fight, rather vision advantage because you've got the Night Stalker there. Eventually, once he ends up getting the Aghanim oh. Scepter, and they're going to go for a last pick, Meepo. Oh, Team Redemption! My heart be still. This is what I like to see. You come back strong in these games. You're, you know, you're gone for however long. I think the last official match on record from Dat Dota was like back in uh, the fifth of this month or. I think about six months ago or so, and then they end up coming back with a Meepo pick. This is wonderful. I am super excited. So, Meepo pick. Now, what does Meepo bring to the table that a lot of other heroes don't typically bring? Meepo is really good at split push. He's also great at catching blinkers, so anti-mage, if he gets caught by the net, can't really get out of there. What else does the Meepo really bring? He comes online very early as well, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the biggest thing for me is that he's going to be somebody to stand up to this Shadow Fiend in lane, and I'm assuming that this is going to be that Meepo in the mid lane. Um, so very, very cool. And I think that uh, it gives you a lot of uh, questions now that you need to answer. Sort of, it's doubling down also on the fact that a lot of MVP Hot Six's draft is built around being sort of really uh, aggressive but single target focused. So.
I just love that. Really excited to see how this ends up going. We'll do a quick little introduction for all of the players here. For Team Redemption, we do have Emmett TR, who's going to be playing on that Bounty Hunter. Also, Zhang Zai is going to be on the Darkseer, heading up there to the top lane. DDZ is going to be your Meepo today. We do have Mozun, who's going to be playing on the Winter Wyvern. I'm sorry about pronunciation, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very sorry about that. And last but not least, Lance playing his Phantom Lancer uh, here for Team Redemption. God, it's terrible. Oh dear. All right then. So it seems like you've given me the more difficult team yet again. Oh my if God, I'll speak stop. Chinese, that would be awesome. No, no, no. It's it's fine. So <laughs> on the side of MVP, MVP hot sticks up towards the top. Then we've got. Oh Jesus. Jojoboji. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Okay, you made this really hard. I went to Korea, but that doesn't mean I actually learned Korean pronunciations. But we've just got the, the nice stalker on the nice stalker today. Up towards the or down towards the secret shop. We've got Doctor on our Shadow Fiend Heen handling our Undying. Uh, anti Mage on the Anti Mage. Aggressive playing on the Bane. Now, people are saying this is the CDEC aggressive. Is this, is this true? He's tagged up as such, and it does seem like that is going to be what they're going to have happen. So, kind of interesting there to begin a little bit of a stand in. Also, worth noting that Night Stalker did end up getting. It is not. Okay. They did end up. Thank you, Corrupt Drop there on the stats. They did end up being able to deny out this ward up here for the Night Stalker. So, a nice little win there at the very beginning. Meepo also going to be able to pick on up the Bounty Rune up there in the top spot, which is going to make his laning stage a little bit easier. Now, this is something that's very interesting also that you need to keep in mind. Oftentimes when you end up thinking about Shadow Fiend in the early stages of the game, he wants to be able to get himself, as we might end up seeing, a courier kill. Now, they're going to keep it up there on the high ground, realizing the inherent danger of having a bounty hunter in the game, but you want to often get him off to a really good start because he has low base damage. But if you take a look at the relative base damage here, Meepo actually has significantly lower base damage, so him denying creeps out is not really going to be an option as long as both players are playing about at the same level. And uh, it's going to be a tough one to see, as we do end up having a little bit of damage up here in the top lane. They rotated the peel up there as well. So peel versus Night Stalker matchup. Typically, be looking at the Night Stalker being the, more, the much more stronger hero. And Lance actually jumping in a little bit of trouble here, having to throw out the nuke to make sure that there is no chase from the Night Stalker. Rotation's coming in, though. He's pretty low. He's got no extra region outside of the tango. He's got to be very careful. They could pick him off here, and it looks like they are going to go try and attempt to get for the Night Stalker. And it looks like it should be an easy kill. First blood going in the way of Team Redemption, already redeeming themselves in this Ooh. first game with a first blood. Nice, very good. Um, and yeah, that is going to leave open the mid lane a little bit longer for Meepo to be slightly uh, vulnerable here, but considering that we're not actually seeing those rotations by the supports in quickly enough, I don't think that they end up really finding anything here. Also worth noting, Shadow Fiend only at level 2 right now doesn't really have the damage to burst down this Meepo as of yet. They're going to need probably at least level 2 raises as well as a pretty clutch Nightmare there on the Bane to be able to keep him alive. But this is the other thing about Meepo, is that if you think about the way that Nightmare ends up interacting, is we have a bit more damage up top, they're just going to push the Nightmare or the Night Stalker, rather, out of range, uh, he can take the Nightmare off of himself and just sort of rotate in as long as he has the other Meepo relatively nearby and uh, can be a bit of a trouble to try and make any real type of effective gank happen on that hero, particularly if you have any type of TP rotations. Yeah. So for the moment, we're going to have a bit of a jump here on some unit thing. They want to apply this load. It's going to be there, and Lance should be able to finish. No, he actually does not finish him off. In the meantime, the Winter Wyvern gets it. They still get the kill on the Undying, but it's still going to be a massive win here for Team Redemption as the Phantom Lance is having a very good time in this top lane. He hasn't really gotten kills going his way. He's got two assists, but it means that this top lane has had a lot of aggression uh, thrown out in the way of MVP. And if they want to get that back, they need to commit their support. They're only going to bring in Heen as the, as the Bane is going to continue on roaming around, but let's be honest, what contribution has the Bane really provided so far? Is he just going to sit in mid lane to keep uh, Doctor alive? Is he supposed to go for stacks? Because the stacks don't seem to be happening either. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's kind of a tough one to make happen here. Like, they're not really in a great position to have anything go their way so far. We do end up having a bit of a find over here, and Diane was able to scout on out the Winter Wyvern, but uh, that's just going to be a quick little walk away after the Arctic Burn was committed, and meanwhile in the mid lane yet again we have the Bounty Hunter jumping forward. This is going to be a quick little poof here. Doctor might end up going down, and just like that, Meepo ends up getting another kill. Is going to be hasted run away. One more bottle charge is going to keep him there and turn him back around. Febby might be going down shortly. Also, no, not going to opt to do it. They back on out as we did end up getting that stat come in that uh, it is going to be Febby on the Bane there in the mid lane, sat it up as, uh, as aggressive. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it looks like in the top lane they're gonna try and jump onto Lance. It seems like they do, and they just melt him here, which he as well as our Night Stalker. Unfortunately, the Wyvern, with it, without any points in the Cold Embrace, really isn't able to provide any sustain. Chad, if he gets a kill on the Meepo, did not get to see that, unfortunately, but. Still a very, very nice kill going in the way of the Shadow Fiend, considering that he had a pretty rough time in this mid lane. Getting a counter kill definitely going to be helping him out. Now, the matchup we haven't really spoken about so far is the Anti Mage Darkseer. And the, sm the slight advantage you have in running an Anti Mage against a Darkseer is that he's obviously being melee, you're going to be at a slight disadvantage. But if you just put points into Spell Shield, you can really mitigate the amount of damage output from the Darkseer. And you can sit in lane almost forever as long as you have that constant regen, which is what the Ring of Health is going to provide. And CS-wise, anti Mage has done pretty well. Yeah, definitely. He's been having a great time. As we do end up having a little bit more action up in the top lane, yet again, they're going to jump onto the Night Stalker. Are they going to be able to burst him down here? He's got a lot of regen. It's also nighttime. If they could find this kill on him right as it's going to go there, fast Phantom Lance, that's going to be enough to commit that one. And now trying to take out this Tombstone before you think is get a little too scary here. It looks like Winter Wyvern is going to be able to make her way out of here as she doesn't have the extra Arctic Burn, but does have Boots. So that's going to keep her alive, at least for the time being. And a really huge huge kill there. The fact that you're able to take out that Night Stalker during nighttime, this is the time when he's supposed to be able to really hit his sort of power curve, and um, really unfortunate there for the Night Stalker they ended up going down. So, with the disadvantage that this Night Stalker has had with such an aggressive lane and dying a couple of times, does he have to go back to Amidas? Does he wait till the second night time? What would you really do with Radiant the Night Stalker? Would you still be aggressive with him? I think that's the main question with this first night time. I think right now you just kind of need to secure your lane a little bit. There isn't an easy lane for him to kill. If he was able to move on over to the side and maybe make a gank happen on the Meepo, that would probably be the best positioning for him because if you take a look at bottom lane oh they end up jumping on top of the never mind forget what i'm talking about they're just going to kill off lance and if they end up dropping the tombstone down i really thought that he was going to be able to stay alive longer if you took a look doppelganger was not committed for that one and he just needed to have better positioning i feel like a little bit too far forward and that's going to be a 600 to 700 gold swing off the back of it and that sort of mitigates a lot of the damage that ended up happening at the early stages yeah, so good news for the Night Stalker. He needs a little bit more out of this, though. So we'll have to see if the Night Stalker does decide to go for other lane rotations or if he's going to sit up tight and sit up tight in that top lane and continue on getting his own farm to really commit to that secondary night time. Six minutes in, CS is looking very good, actually, for Team Redemption. They are mostly ahead of uh, MVP, just slightly behind uh, if you take a look at the Anti-Mage and the Night Stalker. They're not CSing incredibly well, but they are hanging pretty nicely in their lane. The Anti-Mage has had no contests so far. Yeah. So with the current lane that Anti-Mage is in again, does he just rush his Battle Fury? Does he go for Treads first? I, I like the idea of the Battle Fury first. I, I think that particularly if you continue to not get sort of pressured super hard at this point, um, as it does look like we're going to have the Bounty Hunter come on in here and try and soak up a little bit of experience. I, I think that really you want to try and get off to an early start and a good start. They are maybe going to be able to find him here. No dust in the area, unfortunately, and Bounty Hunter is going to get away from this one scot-free as we have a bit of a chase up here top, but it doesn't look like they're going to be able to take on out that Night Stalkers and Dying's still sticking around. I, I think Battle Fury makes sense. Um, and if you start getting pressure early, then you can go back for the treads. Uh, but I think if you wanted to, you could probably just go for brown boots at this point and then right on into the perseverance. Yeah, I can, I can, I can really be on board with that. So for timing windows now, so you take a look at both teams. They have objectives. You, MVP's trying to either buy time for the anti mage or just have a very, very dominant early game so that the anti mage comes online later on. Whereas for Team Redemption. They also would you say that they also want to move into a semi late game scenario, or do they do they just want to secure farm on the Meepo and then just Radiant push on forward from that? Because I think that's also an option. They can just group up once the Meepo does have some significant amount of farm. Yeah, I think that you know you we talked about in the draft a little bit as we see Doctor take on out these stacks and Bounty Hunter is going to be able to get the levels off of this. Um, we talked about the fact that this this Phantom Lancer is an incredibly dynamic hero. You know, he can go late game if you end up getting those really huge items on him, save for him, and end up going very much into a farming build. The other thing that this hero can do is fight very early. You end up picking maybe a quick drums up on him, and you can start getting into quick early engagements with that Meepo. And to me, 
that might be the way that they want to go instead, considering how fighting they've been. And they're just going to be able to jump here on top of the Night Stalker yet again. So much damage. Lance is going to come out of this one with the Doppelganger, kill him off, and now maybe going to have to turn their attention on over to the Tombstone. Really good focus there of it, but they end up having just a bit too much damage coming out from the Undying as PL ends up going down there. Bottom lane uh, doesn't look like they're going to have anything. Just trading hits. But yeah, he microed those illusions pretty effectively, but there was too much damage. And I think that probably drums and then group together with the Meepo once he gets his blink up, I would say. Maybe you end up waiting until blink, because he's probably going to go for Ags first. Uh, it depends. Like some, I think he is going to be going for Ags first. So he's sitting on three, 3k gold. There's no reason to not buy the blink dagger if you do have the gold for it. Unless right. he goes for something such as Boots of Travel. Some Meepos do like to do that as well, having Boots of Travel's global presence and obviously global farming time with, with each Meepo having their own set of Boots of Travel. Yeah. A bit more damage up top. To They're going to be able to get the soul rip out, keeping alive that uh, Night Stalker slightly longer. I, I And, you know, that is one of the options that we talked about also, is that I, I said that I think probably the strongest play would be if he ends up going for drums, but they don't have to do that either, as we end up seeing Night Stalker get dove again. This is the saddest Night Stalker in the world right now. One in four, he ended up getting killed several times in the first night time, and, well, he did end up getting a return kill. It just really hasn't worked out for him at all. Let's take a look at the team net worth, because that's something to keep in mind. 2,000 ahead uh, in terms of team redemption, as well as about 750 experience. So... If they end up hitting a timing here before Shadowfiend gets his mechanism, I think that they can probably push this on out and really start to take a lot of team fights. I don't think they have to, though. And it's really going to come down to feel. And that's probably the coolest thing about this draft is that, um, you know, I talked about going for the drums, but he could just as easily go for a Boots of Travel on this PL and start to try and take away all the farm across the rest of the map. Because... Uh, Team MVP is very greedy at this point. We do end up having the Fiends group committed, and one more right click is going to be enough. They did drop Tombstone for that. Not sure if you want to go for boots of travels this early on though onto the phantom lance yeah. i would still like him to get some early stats first because there's a lot of uh, burst potential on mvp and that silence from the night stalker is really really scary for a hero like pl he needs his spells so if he's silenced up he's a sitting duck and he's essentially a free kill so maybe later on down the line after he's picked up drums after he's picked up just any sort of stat based items to really help him out then it's fine he goes for power treads and stats though so he is building out stats yeah. So the PL, he is preparing to fight. In the meantime, though, we've got a smoke here from MVP, and they've got their eyes set on this Meepo. Very, very crucial kill. Can they get it, though? Oh, they're going to run right on into him. Nightmare's committed. They might be doing this a bit slow, though. As they all show up, they are going to be able to get the Brain Sap off. That kills him of the pure damage not being reduced by that naturally high magic resistance. But there's the Winter's Curse committed onto the Night Stalker. He's starting to drop pretty low. That's going to be a kill. Now we have them back in the middle of everything. Can they find this one? Lance is doing a lot of damage to them, and unfortunately, they aren't able to find the real Lance. Look at the brain sap damage, though. It's just so immense. And ends up trading the Nightmare over to his Illusion. Really well played there by Lance, but can he get out? No, he ends up popping there to the Mana Void. Three dead, meanwhile. They only end up taking one in that Night Stalker. And that was the trouble. They were just able to burst down that Meepo too quickly. And a quick, quick 1,600 gold swing, as well as 2,100 experience. So this is huge for MVP. All of a sudden, it's going to speed them up towards that item progression. And then once they hit their items in the timing window, I don't see MVP stopping because this is the signature style of play. If they can get their items as well as their levels, they will just push, push, and push. They don't honestly care. They take objectives, a very, very objective-based team, honestly. Uh, you, you sometimes you see teams, they'll kind of skip around things a little bit, go for kills, farm a little bit more. Maybe MVP in the meantime, once they get their items, attack. They go straight for objectives. They want to finish the game essentially. Mm -hmm. So this is good news for MVP to have a team fight go that way this early. And of course, you've also got the anti mage there for that late game sort of insurance policy to make sure that you're going to be able to really scale well into the late game and get the rack going potentially while the rest of your allies end up taking and carrying the team fight. It's still always a really big risk. Like, you looked at how those poofs ended up working for that Meepo there. He brought in only two of them. He's about to be able to finish off his Aghanim Scepter in just a second as it is being brought out to him. And considering that's going to be the case, he's now going to have four of them. That's so much poof damage. Maxed on out, 140. You take that as you go and you receive, so that's going to be 280. Times four is going to be off-the-fly math um, right around, what is that, 1,000 and... 1,120? Is that correct? That's a lot of damage. It's... Let's just not even bother doing math. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> actually... <laughs> well, he pops the dust, surprisingly enough. Was probably expecting the Bounty Hunter to be around the corner, but unless he just misclicked it. 
It's Dyer quite far from a hotkey. No Definitely. idea. Sometimes it happens. You just you didn't, you misclick things. You think, oh crap. You use my dust. I it's think fine. that nobody saw. PL is actually going to go down here in a second. Unfortunately, it's going to turn on into him. End up committing the nightmare. His only hope is just to create a ton of illusions. Does bounce on out of there. They actually don't have the single target lockdown for him as of yet. There's the fiend script though, and he is going to go down. And now bounty hunter might have overstayed his welcome as well. He ends up getting caught on up with the dusk urn charge committed, and he's definitely going to go down. Night stalker ends up with another kill, and kind of feeding their life away there. They are going to be able to get a couple of objectives while this is happening. Meepo was thinking about being able to jump there on top of the anti mage. Just about to be able to hit the net. That does actually commit now, and the poof's on in. That's going to be a kill. Very clutch kill. 800 gold swing for the two kills on the Radiant, and then to turn that back around is going to be 600 gold going the direction of the Meepo. But they are going to lose a tier 1 tower here, maybe. Unless they want a team fight for it, then they're going to bring all their heroes in. Darks is going to be the first one to come in with the Wyvern as well as the Meepo. Insnet connects onto two heroes. Going to burst him down. Doctor's dropping very low right in the front line. He will pop the Red Queen, but he goes down. The rest of his teammates, do they go for the turn? Looks like they want to try and jump on the Dark Trooper. He's already surged out. Now Lance, he wants some revenge, wants to try and take down him, this big, bad undying. He's very tanky, though, in the backside, though. The supports are coming in. There's the Bane. Actually, just catches out onto the Dark Seer. He's going to be toggled through the Winter Wyvern. They will pop over with the Dark Seer in the meantime, and Lance. Just gonna go for the tombstone here, the Night Stalker. They will try and nuke down the PL. Now he's in a lot of trouble there. Maybe which one's the real one just because of the Ion Shell. That's the disadvantage of this Dark Seer. They will manage to pick him off with all oh, Anti Mage. They actually toggle on the Anti Mage. Gonna try and continuously uh, change it through, but they will get that kill finally on the Phantom Lance. So three for two trade, no buybacks. Huge win for MVP. For Team Redemption, did it feel like it was a bit of an overextension to go that far for some of those kills? Totally, and the other thing there that we didn't consider also is that Peel died at the start and the end of that fight. He was the first one that ended up getting picked off, then he came back in and was the last one that ended up getting picked off, and this is your hard carry. This is the person that's supposed to be able to give you that possibility to scale well into the late game. Now he is going to be going for the drums build, so it's a little bit more about just kill the tombstone and then try and deal as much damage as you can. Actually, I wonder if he's going to go straight diff blade. There's the possibility that he was just trying to buy out there with the robe of the magi. What do you think about that as a possible build? The sorry, what was that? Straight for the diff blade instead of going for the drums first. Oh. He honestly could go for the straight Diffusal Blade if he really wants to, but you also have to consider how squishy he is this early on. There's a lot of uh, burst potential on the side of MVP, and having the extra damage in the Mana Burn is great. Also having the slow, the purge from the Diffusal Blade is great too, but he also has to consider, is there enough on his team to keep him alive in the process as well? He could, pro he could probably use the rest of his team as a diversion, come in and go for those little pickups on the edge, but you know how MVP is focusing, focusing him down. Yeah. If they see the PL, they will snipe him. Definitely. Well, Bounty Hunter baiting a little bit here on the top lane. They are going to be able to find him out off to the side. And Meepo is actually not with them for this fight. He's down in the bottom lane, does not have one of his little guys around them. So he's going to be going for split push at this point and should be able to do a pretty decent job of it. But trying to build on up towards that Blink Dagger is, I'm assuming, what he's going to be doing. And the rest of the time, his entire other team is going to be moving up on the top lane, trying to create as much space as possible. Yep. So now that we've had these couple of... He actually picked uh, off the anti-mage. I didn't realize that. Oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> didn't see that either. Well, anti-mage is dead now. That's a nice that's a nice kill, though. Just, just slowing down the anti-mage's progression. 16 minutes in, though. Uh, anti-mage is close to his battle fury. It's not the most amazing timing. He has got power and treasures. He's fighting with the team. DDZ will get out. Not going to get caught. No, he just goes for a proof from the spot. Okay, I think he might be in trouble. Nope. Aggressive will be the first one to go down. Going to go for the nightmare first. He actually does not get denied. He'll get picked up by the Meepo. Now, MVP, they see all of these Meepos. So they commit there. There's a lot of them here. They're going to keep on going for the Instaness. Does not connect. They will finally get the nice one. But here comes the Blink in. DDZ. Oh, he's going off everybody. He gets one. But that's so close. All that poof damage. And that's points and spell shield paying off right now. He only ended up leaving one in mana brink, realizing how much extra damage you're going to be taking. And that extra 6%, well, actually, what is that? That's right around 8% magic resistance that you end up getting from a second level in it, really paying off. That's something to keep in mind in this draft, is that a lot of the side for uh, Team Redemption is going to be magical damage. They are going to toss in out the Splinter Blast, as well as the Winter's Curse not yet committed. So I'm just going to let the Shadow Fiend walk away from this one, thinking about it, but not opting to go for it in the end. 
It would have been diving under a tower, and you know how MVP goes for the Dive consistent the reinforcement. Tower. If they see someone under a tower being dove, they will TP it. So I think just smart play for Team Redemption not to go for those overextensions, as we've seen a couple of times that they do overextend, and it's been their downfall. Uh, Bounty Hunter just puts a ward down, sees Doctor, just gonna hoof it out of there. Yeah. 18 minutes into the game now, there's a Bounty Hunter on Team Redemption, we haven't seen too many track kills this game, and I feel like this is a downfall for Team Redemption, because if they didn't have a Bounty Dyer's Hunter, I think any other support attack. would give them a lot more than the Bounty does. Dust is deployed, and he ends up being free free. Gonna go for a quick TP, is there anything to cancel? This is a clean script. Very close. That was very close. I think maybe with the longer... Uh, oh, Meepo actually going to be able to get a kill on the Undying down here in the bottom lane. So shit for Tad as they end up going for it. 500 gold swing into their favor after that one. This is the problem they end up casting Meepo games is everybody just kind of goes crazy in terms of uh, how mov much movement there is all around the map. And it does look like the Battle Fury is going to be a little bit behind time for this uh, Anti-Mage, unfortunately. And... I think in the meantime also, having the Winter Wyvern go for a lot of these nuking type abilities first, this is kind of the constant build that you end up seeing. It's going to mean there's always pressure on the map everywhere that they go, and that's really important. The fact that they're constantly keeping the lanes pushed in. What do you think about the Shadow Fiend with the BKB first item? Uh, BKB first item. The only thing it really provides is that he's not going to be vacuumed, he's not going to get poofed, so a lot of the incoming damage from Team Redemption is going to be mitigated. He can still be Winter's Curse, but I think the fact that the Shadow Fiend isn't going to be taking all that burst damage is going to be a problem for Team Redemption because they don't have the best physical right click if you look at their draft at 20 minutes in. Later on, the PL is going to be hitting like a truck. Meepo hits quite decently as well. But because of the magic Dyer's immunity, I think the Shadow Fiend is going to have a massive edge over Team Redemption as long as he doesn't get Winter's Curse. It might even just be so that he has a BKB, he can, he can still get Winter's Curse. Maybe it's just to force the curse away from the rest of his team. Honestly, it's just extra stats, magic immunity, it's just so useful this game. And the 10 second duration as well is huge. Although, picking up a Aegis after that, well I guess you could die the first time, then pop the BKB when you come back. Then you'll That's... be an unstoppable force. That to me seems like the purpose of this, is maybe to try and do a slow siege on these towers here and push on into them, just right click them down, sort of bait yourself out there and try and get the initiation there from the Meepo. And while Poof obviously is a pretty low cooldown, I mean, you take a look at the spell as a whole, it's only six seconds at the mass, max level. Still, if you're able to have that long cast duration and maybe you end up being able to have, you know, just the first volley go onto the Shadow Fiend, which gets wasted essentially, then you're gonna be able to sort of take away a lot of that damage that would come out in other uh, situations, but Anti-Mage, the inkling that something might not quite be right up here, it's just going to back on out, ends up blinking away from this one, uh, as he did not see anybody else on the map, and realizing probably they're right up here in my face, and going to be trying to gank me in a second or two, and looks like we might be trading towers in a second. T1 for T2 though, it's really not that worth it. If they can come back, defend the T2, but get that T1 for free, then it would still be a decent trade for MVP. So Team Redemption, do they commit for this tower? They're hanging around, so it seems like they are going to commit to this 100%. Well, and we'll see what ends up happening here. A newly finished Diffusal Blade on the PL, which means his positioning is going to be very, very important in terms of making sure he doesn't get picked off. As you alluded to, it's a trade-off. You get a little bit more of a glass cannon build out of this hero. It's not as tank. It's not as tanky, and with only a thousand HP, he really can get picked off early. So we're going to need to see the positioning by him, and probably Meepo is going to be want, needing to be a little bit more of a frontliner this game than he would otherwise. So now the Diffusal Blade is done, do they continue with this aggression? They didn't take the tower in the top lane. Do they maybe go for a smoke, try and go for a pickoff, and move it into an objective? Um, I think that's, I honestly, I think you probably need to wait for the Aegis, unfortunately, and I don't think that that hurts him too much, considering you ended up going for the Diff Blade on the uh, PL. This is an item that you're going to want always, versus if you ended up transitioning into drums early, I think this game's going to go late, basically, is what I'm trying to say, and for the PL, if he goes for the drums, that's essentially an item slot wasted, but this is always going to be an item that he's going to want, and eventually transitioning on up to a Diff Blade 2, going to give him that extra little bit of agility, as well as giving him the ability to get more uh, diffusal blade charges and I think that probably that's something that we've seen more often is early upgrades of the diffusal charges as well as uh, using it a lot in the early game to make sure that you're able to find those kills and scale well into the late game but doctor just gonna be pushing on up this top lane even though he just has the mechanism and BKB he is still a shadow fiend and pretty terrifying to fight against so we're sitting on quite a bit of gold as well if you look at doctors uh 
gold pile. It's got 3.3k. Is it just going to be the typical sand and yasha? I, this is, it's normally only picked up because you want cheap cost efficient damage and if you want to finish early. Unless you want to move into a more late game scenario, what would you, what else would you typically see on a Shadow Fiend if you want more cost efficient damage? The only other thing that I could think about would be trying to... I've seen it once or twice was like an early bat, or a butterfly rather, which felt very, very strange to me. But it ended up working out okay for mids. We do end up having a blink poof immediately. You're going to be able to burst on on the anti-mage and that's the power of this hero. This meepo is not afraid of anybody. He's running right into the midst of them. They're going to be able to commit so much damage there. Requiem of Souls come out and they do finally get the kill, but it comes at the cost of the Night Stalker and the Anti-Mage. So 75 seconds away, it would have been the Aegis taken down and kind of an even trade. That was the ballsiest play I've seen today. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it, but you take a look at what he did. He drew a lot of attention down towards that bottom lane and now look at top lane. You've got Team Redemption just going for a, a full-on push in this top lane. And now that you know that two heroes are down and also one TP is down, the defense in this top lane is not going to be very strong. And there is a chance that Redemption may try and go for a dive on any of these heroes if they do come a little bit too close. So really smart play coming out from Redemption using Meepo is not just our diversion, but also just to create space for the rest of their team to get those objectives. They catch out the Undying, I'm sorry, they catch out the Dark but instead they're going to go for the curse straight on Tahini. He's got the Ghost Scepter, but that's not going to be quite enough to keep him alive as Lance. Going to finish him off. No, he's actually going to be able to go out with that heal. And unfortunately the Illusion's not quite enough to get him out of there. Well, sorry, get him down. So, wall deployed, curse deployed, and they got nothing in the process. Tower's pretty low. It's actually in deny range if MVP wants to go for the deny, but they want to play aggressive as we've got Doctor with an invisibility rune. Not quite close enough to these heroes yet, though, and I think at this point, just back up. They didn't lose anything massive, and it's fine. That's the, the zombies around the tower. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're crazy. That's the thing is that, like, when you end up having the PL in this game, the zombies spawn that much more quickly, and then they, you get a huge amount of damage or heal that comes out from the soul rip. And I think that it's kind of a, a really scary heal that you don't often think about. Like when you have a hero like the PL that is able to, you know, uh, burst down the tombstone quickly because of all those illusions, it also makes Undying stronger before the illusions end up taking down the tombstone. So kind of a, a little bit of a scary situation as we do see the Meepo, as you saw there, start to get closer and closer to being able to pick up that Scythe of Ice in a second or two. So Scythe of Ice, that's, that's a huge item pickup because it means that he can literally jump onto any hero on the side of MVP, just hex them up, go for the poof combo, and they typically should be dead, although they're going to try and jump onto somebody. It's going to actually be the Bounty Hunter, and they should be able to burst him down. He, in the meantime, going to go full on balls deep in that front line. They take two down already with the PL, and now we've got everyone on the side of Team Redemption. They need to retreat. They have to get out of here. They're going to prioritize the Nepros. They know how annoying they are. They're going to be in there on to four. They're going to actually poof them down. Doc is quite tanky. They're going to try and burst someone down. Nice talk. They're going to be healed up again by the Undying. Too many units. It's just not working in Doctor. Being focused down by Lance. They're going to start bursting through these heroes. Three of them are dead so far. Winter's Curse onto aggressive Lance. Let's try and finish them off. It's just a Bane and an Undying. There's no TPS here. It's just a utility. They can pick them off easily as Undying is down. And now we have our Doctor Ganger. Oh. The fake. And the gem. No. Oh, no. Do they know the gem? No. That was so close. Oh, no. <laughs> God, the turnaround there was so spectacular. The Winter's Curse at the, or not Winter's Curse, excuse me, Cold Embrace at the last second by the Winter Wyvern, and I was clicking on the Winter Wyvern throughout the course of that fight because Winter's Curse was off of cooldown in like 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 3 seconds, and barely staying alive, able to get it off at the last second and keep that one Meepo alive, even through the Mana Void. It's just, it's one of those heroes where you cannot discount the amount of damage that he can deal in a burst to your entire team. If you group up, you're going to get poofed on and even though they ended up having to commit the uh, buyback by the Phantom Lancer he's gonna at the end of the day come out on top of it with the Yasha on top of his diffusal blade he is behind the anti-mage but not crazy far behind still very 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 good comeback in that engagement and um, team redemption looking good so far I'm really impressed it's just been how the team fights have been going on after a while. They've, they've got their footing, they've got their tools necessary, and now the team fights are getting a little bit easier. And the thing as well is that if these team fights still, if these team fights keep going their way, they're running a bounty hunter, so they're getting more gold than they typically would just because of the track goal. So the team redemption, oh. It's a Scotty, not a uh, not a Scythe of Ice on the Meepo. This is another great item on him. 
Um, you obviously get a little bit of extra slow that comes out from the Scotty. It's only committed onto the original Meepo, so it's not as good as you would normally expect on, uh, you know, being able to toss it out on every single one of them. But it's just the pure stats. You look at each and every single one of these Meepos at this point, right around 2,000 HP. They do significantly more damage, 148 a pop. So they're going to be doing as much as one direction of their poof in terms of their right click damage on top of the Geo Strike. So all in all, this item is spectacular on the Meepo. Gives you that sustainability, the tank ability to be able to sustain through a Requiem of Souls that comes out from the Shadow Fiend. And now he's going to be even less afraid to jump on top of the whole team fight. And that's, I think this is a great pickup. It's not something I was expecting, but I'm really, really happy with it. I'm actually really happy with it as well because you also take into consideration that if you're incredibly tanky, what does that also give you? It means that there's more more of a necessity for MVP to to have damage. And are they actually going to come to a situation where they're going to start running out of damage when, for example, if the two cores are dead, what do the rest of the heroes do? There's just no damage output from them. They're not running a Scarif Mage. They don't have any heroes that have any significant burst that scales into the late game outside of the Anti-Mage and Shadow Fiend. So if they can't kill off these heroes with the Anti-Mage and Shadow Fiend, how are they going to deal with them at all? Yeah, it's a real problem. I mean, you think about the way that you deal with Meepo, and um, I, I kind of... It's a bit of a strange situation. You expect big AoE damage to be the thing that you want to look for, but really it's single target damage uh, in Alina and then like AoE disable. So you think about like a Jakiro, for instance, being able to toss on out an ice path in the middle of everybody and he catches several of those Meepos there. That was kind of one of the classic examples and ways to deal with a Meepo when he was really big uh, a couple of patches ago. But it looks like we might be end up spoiling for another fight here. They don't really have the greatest vision of this, and they do have the option to just jump forward, vacuum wall, onto four, Winter's Curse on top of it. Doctor does pop the BKB, that's also going to be a Requiem of Souls out. Everybody is very low mana void on top of the Darks here. He's just going to be able to run away from that one, though, and they're continuing to chase out of here. My frame rate is dying. Too many zombies all over the map. Lance is trying to run away so far as the Bounty Hunter for the Undying, and that's it off the back of it. MVP are in a pretty good spot to be able to fight this one. Where is the Meepo though? He's riding up at the top barracks. It looks like Aggressive is going to go down on this Bane. Lance ends up getting out of there. He's not going to be able to defend himself any much longer. Still staying alive throughout all of this. Finally Anti-Mage is back in. But meanwhile Meepo eyes on the prize. Aegis has now picked up. Lance is going to be able to get out of there. Also took the top barracks and Lance just needs to run away. Oh, is going to be able to get the Invis rune and walks away on 8 HP. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, Oh, it was good. <laughs> that, was, that was very good. I was, I was watching the the PL just completely outplay MVP. What he did was he would consistently micro an illusion rather than the hero, and MVP kept changing target, changing onto the illusion, changing onto the actual PL, because they just didn't know which one was the real one. So it was literally just a chase with the Benny Hill music, really. <laughs> it, was very, it was very entertaining, honestly. But um, getting the Aegis and ratting, massive win for Team Redemption. Their decision making is spot on this game. They know what they want, they know what they need to do, and they're executing it on point. So they got the combo down, they took their objectives, they get out with their major heroes. This is such a massive win for Team Redemption. I honestly am gobsmacked at their performance so far. It's really impressive. Like, you think about that. I was following around the PL the, the entire time with the camera, and the whole time that I was doing it, MVP Hot 6 was doing it also. And then you end up just being able to see the Meepo move on up to the top lane, has a guy there ready to poof everybody in, then poofs everybody out back to the Roche pit. You take both of them. Now you've got a Meepo with Aegis, a huge net worth lead. You're ready to start taking the other tier twos. And Darks here now picks on up the Sheep Stick. Like, they are in such a great position. Looking at it, 13 k net worth in terms of experience we're at about the same and i don't see them stopping at any given point in time there's no way for mvp hot six to really effectively deal with this they have disables but it's mainly single target they have damage which is aoe and not being able to really burst a single target down look at that night stalker fall he is going to finally go down there with one last toss of the shuriken from that bounty hunter tracked on up why not and they're not going to commit onto him. So it looks like for the most part, they're going to stick together and they're going to go for the push. And this is a really bad situation to be in if you're MVP. Because look at buyback status. They've only got one buyback and it's on the Night Stalker. It's essentially on one of the heroes that you, 
If he doesn't have buyback, it's okay. If it's on the anti mage and the Shadow Fiend, then at least they've got a decent chance at defense. But with the Night Stalker, yeah, buyback's not really going to be his friend. Oh, jump forward. They don't connect on a Doctor with all of the poof damage out yet. That's the BKB popped. It's keeping him alive a little bit longer. Look at all this damage, though. The right clicks abound. They're going to be able to get the Winter's Curse on top of them. Still staying alive throughout it, but that's finally going to be a kill on the anti mage. The Tombstone Zombies are just too much for any computer to be able to hold. And it looks like that's a killing spree for him. He and getting chased up all across his base. He's going to go down to the Geo Strike as well. There's no way to be able to defend against this as the Ghost Scepter does come out, but still poof damage goes through it. GG ends up getting called. Team Redemption, we're not going to make that pun again, but you guys know what it's all about. Really well played for them. I'm, I'm super impressed with the way they played this. During the early game, it was a little bit shaky. It was definitely in favor of MVP, but they got their footing, and once they got their footing, they, stuck, they, they stood there and they fought right through MVP. So MVP, what do you feel like was the downfall for them? Was it just the fact that Meepo and their, their whole team just got a little bit too big? Was it because they weren't aggressive enough? Was it because they're lacking items? What do you think was the downfall? I think honestly it's what you said there. It was the Meepo needing to have the answers and they just didn't have it. A last pick Meepo, if you're not care capable of dealing with it, can really, you know, just destroy your draft. And I think also the fact that they didn't necessarily rotate as well effectively early like no matter what they were going to be behind in the draft but i also felt like there are various points where team redemption ended up outplaying them and uh if you're already out drafted you got to come with the also just the sort of consistent good execution and unfortunately we didn't end up seeing that that time so gg well played moving on to game two in just a second here at lyrical dota as well as at danny lee cast and corrupt drop bear on the stats thank you guys for watching and we'll be back in just a second stick around
at Southeast Asian Series. I'm Lyrical Dota, joined today by Danny Lee Cass, as well as Corrupt Drop Air on the stats. We're going to be taking a look at Team Redemption up against MVP Hot 6, looking for their possibility to move on into the next series of this tournament. Danny, how are you doing? And uh, were, did you, were you a little bit surprised by what we saw last time? Five seconds I'm hoping the mic is okay this time. It's going to be super loud. Is all right? Yeah, it's fine. I believe in you. You're great. Just yell. Yell all you want. We're good. <laughs> I'm not going to yell. <laughs> but I was very surprised at Team Redemption's performance. We haven't seen them in so long, and you know when you haven't seen a team for so long, you don't know what to expect from them. And from the last game, absolutely spot-on play. A little bit shaky during the early game, but we have to admit there were a couple of times, and it looked like it was going to be going in the way of MVP. But after a while, you just saw them chugging along in Hot 6. They, just, they really couldn't do anything. And it, I think to a certain degree, it had to be that last pick Meepo that really caught them off guard. They never really had the best tools in dealing with the Meepo. Just because they had a lot of AoE damage, they could be very aggressive. But if the game goes to a very, very late portion of the game, they start running out of damage. Anti-Mage or Shadow Fiend, doesn't matter. Those two heroes in themselves were not enough to deal with the Meepo and a farmed PL. Absolutely, and that's something that you're always going to need to be careful of. I mean, I think there that what you saw to Team Redemption was that they recognized a weakness in their draft, in MVP Hot 6's draft. They said, you know what, they don't have any way to be able to deal with our, you know, AoE heroes here, these heroes that require some some AoE disable, and then they just took advantage and rolled with it from there. And, you know, the, the PL kind of felt like the sort of nail on the coffin in conjunction with that Meepo. He ended up going for the early Diffusal Blade, something that we both thought might be a little bit scary, and it was going to depend on his positioning and his ability to outplay his opponents, and he did it perfectly. We saw there in that beautiful mid fight that I'm still just giggling about to myself over here to the side. Like he he was doing great things, being able to micro the individual PL illusions to make one of the enemy team think that that was the real one, and then sort of throw everybody off. Mind games abound. It's worth noting that you know Team Arrow before they ended up having their struggle, they ended up disbanding while well, getting kicked from their team for a reason that is sort of unheard of in that they were not bad it's that they ended up making a mistake and when you end up coming back with that raw level of talent sort of you know re-inspired to go for something strong i'm curious to see where they go from here um, as we do end up seeing the tusk first pick as well as the queen of pain dazzle so some brand new heroes this time it seems and obviously seeing new heroes means we're going to have a quite a bit of a fun time now with what we currently have now, we've got a Tusk and an Ember Spirit on Team Redemption. So they've got a very good, very solid initiator in the Tusk, and they also now have, have some decent team fight as well as high ground defense, high ground push, and an Ember Spirit as well. So for Redemption, they're keeping their options open right now, not going for a, a very, very solid, uh, very, very uh, particular draft yet. As they want to keep things open depending on how Hot 6 wants to play, whereas for them, they have a Dazzle and Queen of Pain, very solid mid hero to keep Hot 6's momentum, and you have a Dazzle, that's going to be a very, very solid support. No definitive strats though, so I think at this point it's safe to say that teams are just going for the safe picks now, they will go for the riskier and more defined picks in this second phase of picks. Absolutely, well... We also have now, um, I, I think that the Huskar ban is something that we're always going to be seeing pretty much forever <laughs> until we end up seeing some type of significant change to this hero. And he's always a, sort of a, a dynamic hero in terms of what he's able to bring to the table. It, for Team Redemption, do you think that they sort of... Um, do do they need to be able to go some another type of draft that's a little bit out of the box? Or do you felt like they had enough sort of execution that they can go for a bit more of a standard play this time around? Uh, honestly, I would say for Redemption is just do what feels comfortable to them. Because we saw last game, they played a draft and they looked very comfortable playing it. And if you can play something that you know that you, you're going to play well and that you know what you're going to be doing with it, then just go for the exact same thing. Don't don't fix what's not broken. They did well last game. If they just do a similar strat to last game, I think I'd by all means be okay with that. Yeah. They don't have to play out of the box. Okay. Well, very interesting. Um, we'll see what they end up going for here as we do have the next pick for MVP Hot 6. They're going to go for a Viper, that sort of tanky, ridiculous, uh, you know, just disgusting hero to play against. Kind of the most frustrating ones, in my opinion, at least, in terms of what you end up seeing. He just kind of always create situations where you don't want to end up uh you know fighting against him you sometimes end up doing more damage to yourself than you end up doing to him and he's so hard to gank do you think that this is probably going to be that mid ember spirit here or are we going to see now that the vipers picked up trying to transition him into that safe lane uh, honestly they could 
do it either way if they really feel like they have to put the Ember Spirit in the mid lane, then he, sh he should do decently well versus a Viper. Not amazing, because he is melee and a lot of the damage from Viper is going to be physical. But it depends on who they want to prioritize. Is it going to be the Ember Spirit that needs the most farm and needs the safe lane, or is it going to be this other hero that needs it? I think depending on what this fourth pickup is, they'll give us more of an idea as to how Team Redemption wants to play with the Ember Spirit. Because you can put him in both lanes. There's, there's no there's no way of saying that Ember Spirit has to go in this lane. He's he's very, very uh, open for one of those core heroes. Hot Six are going to pick up a Earthshaker here. So it looks like they've secured both of their supports. Very, very solid support. And also, if he gets a Blink Dagger, we're going to be seeing some slam dunks this game. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's kind of what you want to end up seeing out of them. Um, unfortunately, we're still having a couple of issues with the uh, with the audio. I'm really sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not exactly sure what all is going on, but I'm going to bring myself down a little bit, and hopefully that ends up being a little bit more close to uh, equitable in terms of everything looking good. But yeah, Ancient Apparition now taken as a, oh, another so one. Insane. I think that this is kind of a hero that um, he's become a lot more in response to the early death ball get up in your face and just sort of destroy you know the enemy in in terms of his ability to regen up from anything and like with the emergence of the defensive supports in the winter wyvern and the dazzle he really has sort of found his place also of course being an answer to the doom and the alchemist that are sort of constantly there but as a hero he does somewhat lack a, a decent amount of disables and that's something that i'm seeing out of team redemption here is they don't have like i i guess well, now I'm saying that the Ember Spirit with the slighted fist into chains is pretty good, and then also Tusk is pretty solid. I'm just worried about his laning stage and how well he's going to be able to do there. Mm, I think so as well. We'll take a look at these last two picks, and then we can really have an idea as to how the lanes are going to pan out and who's going to be going to be going up against who. Interesting Invoker ban here for Hot Six. We don't normally see this hero. He is a very niche pickup, and he does do very well when Naughty does. Not too sure if an invoker would have really shake, uh, would have really shook uh, MVP's hot stick. I guess the the Quas Wex invoker would have been annoying it's as so they've got a lot of mean. mana dependent heroes. So yeah. I guess that's probably one of the main reasons why you get rid of that invoker and also sun strikes because there is an AA. I think that the other thing is DDZ back when they ended up going was like he played invoker a lot and he was able to really uh sort of make that hero his own and with the emergence obviously of this hero more recently we've seen sumail play at a, a bunch of other you know really top tier pros it's something that you really need to be cognizant of and i think that it really can destroy queen of pain depending upon how the laning stage goes if you're able to nuke away all of that mana i mean think about the way that i think it's 600 roughly that you end up getting at max levels if you have agnum scepter that you destroy with emp it's really devastating so i i I like this ban and also um, the other oh, problem that you can end up running with it is that if you get several early points in Exhort, all of a sudden your Ember Spirit basically gets like a free, you know, 50 to 60 damage depending on how many levels you go into it with that uh, alacrity. So either way, it can be pretty dangerous. I, I like this pick right here. Or the, the ban rather, I should say. Yeah. Well, that's a very peculiar pick. I never knew they moved picks over there. Anyways. <laughs> Oh, goodness. So the Juggernaut final ban Tens. here for Redemption. So getting into the Jug means that there's there's no re there's no free regen going in the way of Hot Six and that they're not able to just go for that sort of early game aggressive push and team fight sort of draft that they could have decided to go for if they did go for the Jug. So now we've got 30 seconds left on the clock, roughly for both teams for these final picks. So Redemption, they've got both supports and off lane and technically a mid or a safe lane, whereas for Hot Six, they've got both supports the Viper and the Queen of Pain. Uh, does, this, does this actually shift the Queen of Pain into the safe lane or the off lane role, actually? Ten I think that's the major thing here that we need to take a look at. Or I'll... Spirit Breaker. Huh. Dying I was going to say that I was expecting it to be the Queen of Pain in the safe lane, which I still think it is. And then it maybe is. just running a dual off lane with Earthshaker Spirit Breaker. Or are we going to see the Earthshaker just roam around a lot and be somewhat nomadic? I, I don't like that role for Earthshaker as much, but it seems like it's going to be okay. Um, well, time will tell. We'll end up seeing where they go. Uh, I, I just feel like Earthshaker, there's a reason that he's been getting picked less often in that role over the past couple of months. And I think that yesterday we did end up seeing a bit of a roaming Earthshaker in the SEA games, but... Um, I just don't love it. I feel like that hero desperately needs to be able to get those items. And sometimes if you don't find the kills, uh, it really doesn't work out for you. And then all of a sudden your hero is useless at, you know, 25 minutes into the game. 
Oh, I think there's another dilemma that you have to be thinking of if you're hot six though. They're putting a lot of emphasis on the Queen of Pain to do a lot of the burst Ten damage. So when they go for ganks, they need the Queen of Pain's burst. If there's no Queen, who the hell is going to do it? Viper's remaining. not really the best rooming hero. He can go for a Viper Strike and a couple of right clicks. Damage is okay. Puck, final pick for Redemption. I love seeing this hero. So it's going to be Puck mid, I presume. Ember Spirit safe lane, Tusk off flame for Redemption. But damage for Hot Six is quite thin. It's, very, it's spread very thin. And if the one hero that does it is dead, they really don't have the best draft in compensating for that. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, we've talked about these drafts a couple of times is that teams are kind of, well, I don't want to make a, a wide generalization, so I'm not going to. The SE game, SEA game that we saw yesterday, there was a team that ended up running low on damage. And this time around, we're also seeing the same thing where, at least at this point in time, MVP Hot 6 don't have the amount of damage that I think that they're going to need to really burst down the Ember Spirit if he goes for a slightly more tanky build. That being said, a lot of Team Redemption is somewhat sort of remaining. shaky in their survivability anyways. So it's tough to tell. I think the Viper is going to be a key component in this map. How well he's going to be able to position himself at the start of the fights, because in the middle of the fights, he kind of is just in the same spot regardless. But Prepare if he ends up getting battle. himself into a pretty good possession, position early, then I think that he can really sort of be the difference maker. But we'll see. Yeah, it's, it's really going to be seeing... Uh, we have to take a look at how the lanes pan out, because lanes is going to be huge, not just for MVP, but I think also for Team Redemption. It's going to determine who comes online when, and who's going to be making the plays for for what team. But for Hot 6, I think the main issue here is that if the Queen of Pain doesn't come online early, they're going to have to fall back onto the Viper, which, let's be honest, a Viper in general as a hero that's supposed to be the momentum hero isn't doesn't really do the best job of it. And that's where the rest of the team has to really come together and hopefully uh, complement the fact that if someone's behind, they have to work together to bring it back. Whereas for Team Redemption, they've got a draft where if someone falls behind, they've got another hero that fills in the exact same role. It is absolutely fine. They've got a much more balanced draft, I guess, that is the best way to explain it for Redemption. Queen of Pain just ran into the Tier 1 tower and took some damage. Um, I don't know what that was about, but I uh, had to eat up a tango afterwards, and now I was getting back up to full. That was a very strange little moment there, and it looks like she is going to be able to get this bottom rune probably, trading it off against the Tusk possibly. We'll see how that ends up going. They do end up getting the Ethereal Jaunt away on the Puck. That's going to force out the Salvage use, and now it does look like Tusk is going to be able to get that bounty rune. Should be able to find that one every time with the stun coming out from Snowball. So, nice little change there as we do end up seeing the Tusk get the uh, bottom rune and the Viper get the top rune. So, what is already I feel like a bit of a tough matchup in the Viper versus Puck. You're also going to be down a bounty run. What do you think about this matchup here between these two? Viper versus Puck. Well, the thing with Puck is that he is mostly going to be a utility based mid. He's there mostly for the silence, the initiation with the Dream Coil. So he's not, he's not, I think, I guess the best way to say it is that he's in a similar position to a Magnus where Puck needs a blink. And once you've got that blink on the Puck, he's mostly golden because that's his major item. That's the item that means that Puck's ready to fight, he's there for the team, and that they, that they just get the ball rolling. It's not like a farming mid, like an Ember Spirit that needs the farm, or as much farm as possible, plus levels. So I think for this mid lane scenario, it's going to be hard for the Puck, but he can mitigate a lot of the damage just because he has the has the phase shift, and he just needs to hit that level 6 and also get that blink. Once he has that, DDZ is golden. I, I'll also mention he's well on his way to it, eight and two to start this off as Viper gets his first last hit. That was a just first couple of waves there, just complete and total dominance. And to me, that just looks uh, like we can talk all that we want about heroes and their ability to, you know, do a, a lot of damage. And Viper's a great hero for being able to obviously dominate a lane to a large extent. As we do end up seeing the Queen of Pain getting dove behind tower, she is going to end up getting hit by the snowball there. Do we have a shards? That's going to be committed. And with no blink at this point in time, Queen of Pain does end up going down. It just came off of cooldown. Tusk off to a really good start here and maybe a little bit of action up in the top lane as well. I was a little bit slow on the blink on the Queen of Pain. I think he would have been able to cast it sooner. Not too sure if it was a latency issue, but they're going to try and go for a jump onto the top this time. They want some revenge. Damage is there as well with the heal bomb. Not quite enough though. Snowball going to be connecting onto the creeper as he wants to try and go for a quick juke. Going to try and outrun them, but it's a blink Queen of Pain. You're not going to be outrunning that hero anytime soon. He will try and out regen. Going to be going through the creeps, trying to go for the deny, and all of a sudden, yeah, that's a Tusk sandwich right there. <laughs> nice little blink over to make sure they end up securing that one with the Dazzle. Always good to see that. 
Um, and the courier snipe close, nice little phase shift. Not going to be able to take the damage there, but still is going to be eating a little bit of corrosive skin. Also a charge. Four heroes now in the mid lane. This is DDZ. If they don't get this kill, this is a disaster. Phase shift away. Ethereal Jean and DDZ gets out. Able to dodge away from the charge. And now we also have uh, Sang Zai who's in the area. He's going to start right clicking down. The DD does pop there on the Spirit Breaker. Still on up. If they end up finding one right click, this is going to be a huge turnaround. But Pug able to get away from that one. Even sustaining in lane with the bottle up. Huge turnaround and a big commitment there as they're going to start to cut the creep wave, seeing that nobody else is up in this top lane. So that's the advantage of running a puck in the mid lane. He is such an elusive hero. He's on a completely different caliber of Spirit Breaker dies to Roche. I guess he wants to free trip the fountain. The puck is on a completely different caliber when you talk about mobility. He's so, so elusive, so difficult to really catch unless you have that, uh, for example, maybe a Rubik lift, an instant disable. So for DZ on the puck, a situation like that, it has. you, you know if you are going to be running into so many heroes, you can just play elusive like that and they will never catch you. Because the disable on MVP is, it's quite weak. It's mostly the Earthshaker there that's going to be the main disable for the puck. And then, if aggressive, well, I'd, actually, I don't know what the Earthshaker's name is, but if Earthshaker can't be there to be the one to lock down the puck, who is? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah, it's it's really a rough situation for him. And, you know, I was worried about the sustainability, but I, this is the other thing I'll say. When you pick a hero like Viper, you leave yourself open to the possibility of getting outplayed. And not necessarily that you are going to get outplayed every single time, but at least you have the possibility to outplay this hero because you've got Phase Shift, you've got Jaunt, you've got the Illusory Orb, and now Doctor dropping a little bit low here needs to be careful. And if there aren't too many ways for you as a Viper to be able to outplay your opponent, so the skill cap being that much higher means that you're able to do that much more in lane. And um, I think that right now, Team Redemption are feeling very confident after that last game and uh, think that they're going to be able to take out the rest of the series here. So, pretty cool start to this game as Corrupt uh, Dropter gets us those stats as well. It's a pretty solid one there for the puck. I'm really sad that the hero's really fallen off in terms of popularity. The hero is just very, very fun to watch. You can do so much with it. We've had incredible TIs as well with the puck. But we don't see him anymore. Do you feel like it was just because of the main meta shift where teams are typically picking up those later carrying heroes such as Wind Ranger and Shadow Fiend? I think that was one of it. I think also we've moved into needing that damage. You know, you talk about that there with the, the Shadow Fiend and the Wind Ranger. And um, also, you think back to a little bit before the last patch, uh, high magic burst damage heroes. This is something else that Puck can have some problems with. Uh, if you're not able to just phase shift absolutely perfectly, you can definitely get bursted down by some of those other heroes. And, I mean, take a look at the, the HP right now at this point, 660. And I think it's even more of a difficult position because we've been seeing more often than not dual lanes mid. And while Puck can dodge away from a lot of different problems and early rotations, he doesn't do so well against sustained harassment. I think, uh, which is what we sort of see more often with the Banes picked up occasionally and occasionally the Winter Wyverns also that end up roaming on into the mid lane, uh, which is, I think, part of the reason why they ended up sort of taking that Winter Wyvern for themselves on Team Redemption is that way they didn't have to deal with those problems. Mm. So we take a look at the CS situation for both teams now. So it looks like we've got the Ember Spirit right on top of the CS charts here for Team Redemption. So they're putting a lot of emphasis onto making sure that Lance gets that early farm because of this emphasis, does this mean they want to fight early with the Ember Spirit? Because they're committing both support into this top lane. They might get the kill here under the Spirit Breaker frozen in place. You're going to have a Spirit Breaker popsicle. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. for the Lance though, because of this emphasis, do they want him to farm early to fight early? Is that the reason why they would bring both supports here? I think that probably part of the reason was because they didn't need him in the mid lane. Um, off lane, also relatively safe on their own as the Tusk. And as we actually are going to see the Dazzle get hit on up there by the Dream Coil. Time to TP away, they're not going to be able to find that kill. And that's too bad, that, that one. But I, I think the bigger thing is that they wanted to get levels up on the Ancient Apparition and the Winter Wyvern. And if they just left the Ember Spirit alone against this lineup, as we get the charge on here on top of Lance, this is going to be committed there. Fissure coming out, also Sonic Wave, and that's going to be a quick kill. Um, um, I, I think that as they end up getting this other kill on the Ancient Apparition also, kind of a disaster here. <laughs> um, they needed one person to be able to pull and the other person to be able to harass and lane. And so this allowed them to be able to sort of pull with impunity and constantly get those levels up. And you take a look at the hero levels right now, you know, Ancient Apparition and Winter Wyvern, while low, I, I feel like they're in an okay position. And without those kills, they probably would have been a little bit higher. 
Oh dear, they're gonna try and jump on the lance yet again. This might actually come to be a successful gank. They're gonna continue on chasing with the Earth Shaker. Eight seconds on the fish. They're gonna slow him down here with the Winter Wyvern. Dropping very low, actually. Wyvern should not get the kill, but he will be chased down by both of these heroes. And now Spirit Breaker, very tanky, but now they turn back onto Lance. They still was there onto the Wyvern. He's Carolad, they get the kill on Lance. They will lose the Spirit Breaker. Queen of Pain with the Blink just gets out of there quite nicely. No more catch on the side of Redemption. And that should be it. No, unfortunate there. We do end up having another Blink in seven seconds. So if he's a little bit slow, there's always the chance that you could catch with the Snowball if they just get any little bit of vision. But no, there's the Blink away. Um, I, I think also it's worth noting as we did end up seeing those shards connect there in the end uh the ember spirit ended up skilling up a sleight of fist in the middle of that fight to be able to dodge away from the damage and was able to get away from it but there was just too much to turn around away from it um so i i think that you talked there right before we ended up having this big engagement and it looks like it's a pretty big lead for mvp uh, hot six after that one i don't know if they necessarily have to fight a lot on ember spirit i think that their lineup scales really well into the late game with this hero and probably they would be relatively happy just taking it late i think uh, also because when you end up feeling like you're uh, the better team and i don't want to say that that based off of that last game they, they felt really strong i think in terms of the way that they played you do want to run it to the late stages so that that way you're able to you know keep it going as he does end up getting initiated here snowball forward he does end up getting the shallow grave two heroes in the middle of all of them walrus punch committed now also everybody from the radiant getting very low do they have enough to be able to finish them off here there's going to be the phase shift no not quite in time so now going to be able to get the splinter blast aggressive dropping pretty low that's actually febby and he does end up falling still a lot of damage but that's going to be a sonic wave on top of everybody that's going to be a double kill for the queen of pain winter wyvern ends up getting the finish off four heroes dead down here in the bottom lane for the radiant and a trade for two not the best trade of your mvp for, for team redemption gonna be very happy with how that turned out and that was just off the fact of mvp they came in one by one i think that was the major issue with them they came in one by one they wanted to try and reinforce heen who was a dazzle you think you can get in there because he's got the shallow grape to keep him alive but then you underestimate the damage output from Team Redemption because they've got so many levels on these heroes. You have a level 8 puck who's got a maxed out illusory orb as well as the waning rift. They've got a tusk that's sitting on level 7, not too high, but he is doing quite a bit of damage himself. So the damage output for a Team Redemption is quite high. And the MVP, they're still looking relatively squishy right now. So if they're not careful with their positioning, if they clump up and they get caught in any sort of AoE, you're not going to be looking too good if you're MVP because if the dazzle's gone, there's no extra, uh, there's no extra sustain. There's no heal from a wyvern. There's nothing like an undying. Well, hopefully soon they're going to be able to get that with the mechanism almost finished on Doctor. But um, it is a little bit tough. It, it, I think that before that item, this is sort of a, a timing window where uh, MVP Hot Six need to be really careful. They are going to be trying to clear on out this camp here Radiant's as well by the Queen of Pain and a lot of stacks all around the map. I mean, we saw a couple here for the uh, the Dire as well a little bit earlier as Ember Spirit clears on out the hard camp. And I think that the economy game is going to be really important to keep an eye on as we do have an initiation up top here. Spirit Breaker committing that level six on top of the Ancient Apparition. That's going to be a kill. Snowball forward. Winter Wyvern is here starting to do a good amount of damage. We're going to see a body block in a second or two, I think, as never mind. The Ember Spirit is just all on top of it. Winter Wyvern ends up getting the last hit, but a trade at the end for an Ancient Apparition for your offlaner. I think that that's still, again, pretty worth it for uh, Team Redemption. Uh, I'm not too sure because you also, when you go for these kills, you have to take into consideration you kill this hero, what do you get out of it? You're an offlane spirit breaker, you're going to be killing a support ancient aberration. Your team isn't going to get anything out of it because they, they can't necessarily push too much outside of this because they're not going to get any towers. If they if they could get objectives aside from just a hero kill and losing the offlane, then maybe it would have been worth it. But mm. I don't know, I'm not too sure if that was honestly the best thing that the spirit breaker could have hoped for. Maybe he was hoping to get a quick kill and, maybe, I don't know, kill and run. Yeah. Get away with murder. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, I was actually meaning that I felt like it was more worth it for the, the Ancient Apparition, the side of Team Redemption, to be able to get that kill. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think that that's a little bit scary. What do you think about the two Null Tally build on Puck instead of going for that early Blink Radiant's Dagger? He attack. needs the stats. 
Yeah. Because the Queen of Pain is doing quite a bit of burst, uh, burst, pit, uh, burst damage, and if DZ does not have the two Null Talismans, and he's sitting on roughly 600 HP, so yeah. the Queen just has to throw one combo, and then that's it. Your puck's gone. So I think it's okay. You get extra stats, you get extra mana pool. He's gonna be able to stay on the map a little bit longer. And I guess also a nice thing to note is that even though he's bought the two Null Talismans, he's still well on his way to his Blink Dagger. It's not hindering the Blink Dagger timing either. So it's it's a good use of gold. Oh, that snowball oh, forward. This could be a little bit rough, though. Ancient Apparition Blast does end up going down, but he is super dead. Might be able to turn this one back around with the Winter Wyvern. Ulti Heen dropping low is going to shallow Grave off, though. All of this work could be going down in a second. Lance is still alive in the middle of all of them. Puck has shown up, letting everybody know that here he is indeed. Now they're going to be able to turn this one back around. I think that Spirit Breaker does end up falling. Unfortunately, the Queen of Pain was already out of there, and it does end up making her way up to the top lane now, trying to put a little bit of a uh, counter pressure after the pressure down bottom didn't end up working out too well for them. So it looks like, unfortunately for Ancient Apparition, he's going to be spending most of his time this game in the fountain. He's not <laughs> had the best game, let's be honest. He's, he's died three times 13 minutes in. It's not the best game for, for AA, but he's hanging in there. His team's getting a lot of kills out of it. They're getting Dyer's a lot of gold. And that's good news for Team Redemption. So he'll be patting himself on the back thinking oh, i'll get to watch this game today <laughs> he's the sort of the motivational speaker he's the one that lets everybody know it's gonna be okay guys just look at me and i'm still having a good time eight and ten <laughs> is the current score once again if mvp hot six do lose this game they're gonna be out of this tournament at this point in time uh which would definitely be a bit of a surprise how do you rate MVP Hot 6 in terms of the SEA teams? I feel like you have a, a pretty good handle on it considering you actually are in that region right now and cast a fair amount of games from, or is it something where it's all a little bit tightly contested? MVP, they have days where they can perform as a top tier Southeast Asian team, and then they have days where they're just sort of, they, they look like they just tilt. And I think for today it's more or less just an average day. They're not playing amazing. I haven't really seen any spectacular plays for them today. But they do have potential to go for those really flashy plays. It's just we haven't really seen it. And I think it's also because of their draft. It's sort of handicapping their potential as a team. Because it's an interesting draft. But they don't really have the best tools when it comes to going for those incredible plays. They might get caught out there. Poor Dr. Viper. He's got a mech, but he's going to hit the nice blast and a green coil. He's not going to get out of there. Frozen in place, yeah. The pipe is literally frozen for the whole game. So he goes down. Echo Sun connects. Oh, just in a couple of heroes, but Lance caught out, unfortunately. Will go down as well. Three heroes dead here for Team Redemption, and the rest of them have to get out of here. It's going to be the task chasing here is Apple of Pain. Going to go for the charge. Going to push him on the other side of the vision, but that doesn't really matter as they do catch him out in the meantime. And the only one surviving is DDZ, our elusive puck, who is hanging around. I think he should just back up. Does not want to be in there as there's no one to support him. Oh, just found out there. Double damage puck, though. Oh. Silence comes out. He's actually going to kill off the Queen of Pain right there and then the Stereo Jaunt away. That is that is a pretty bold move right there, but realizing the full limits of this hero, that's what you were talking about, I feel like, in terms of how cool this hero can be and uh, really outplaying your opponents as we do end up seeing another huge turnaround. And I think that Team Redemption, while they did end up losing that fight pretty badly, they're still not in an awful position. MVP Phoenix very clearly ahead, about three to 4,000 gold and uh, a decent amount of experience, but... I still like their draft scalability in the later stages. I think that Spirit Breaker always puts you in a position where you're going to be able to come out ahead onto fights just because of the effect that charge has in terms of really forcing in the engagement that you want, as long as you're charging in the right place, of course. Um, also, Queen of Pain, just the huge amount of burst damage you saw there at the very start. H Apparition, while he did end up getting out the Ice Blast, he also burst it right at the very beginning of it. And I, I think that maybe for team redemption you try and spread out a little bit more you deny away the possibility of getting those two to three man sonic waves and from there you're probably pretty fine but of course if mvp uh hot six continue to sort of perform at the level they've been performing at i i think that they're in a pretty good spot also to take this one uh mvp there they've got a timing window that's the yeah. major handicap with their draft if they don't hit that timing window they're just going to completely fall off compared to team redemption so I would say Team Redemption have the two options. They hold out and wait out this timing window by MVP, or they just stay toe-to-toe, -to -toe, try and keep their items equal, keep the objectives equal, and then they should literally just be fine. Because you compare the drafts, MVP has to be ahead if they actually want to be able to take this game off of Team Redemption right now. And looking at what they currently have, they are slightly ahead, but they do have the chance of just 
having one little mistake and that could be the end of the entire lead. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a very precarious Radiant situation. And I think, you know, you take a look here, Febby getting very close to being able to pick up his Blink Dagger. He's actually probably Radiant just going to sit here and wait for it. Fortified. Meanwhile, the rest of Team Redemption are sitting around, Ancient Apparition in the perfect spot to be able to lay out an Ice Blast. And I think that they maybe want to fight this. They're at least thinking about it. The Sigil is scouting out everything, making sure that it's all hunky-dory. Queen of Pain now also has the Orchid. Dyer's a couple of timing windows attack. coming into play right now. And I think Dyer's that if Team Redemption aren't careful, fortified. if they really try and force this fight they could get i think pretty much uh probably a full team wipe or at least close to it if they're not careful yeah it depends if they want to commit though and i think at this point Dyer's tower top goes top down top and fallen. no one's really making a move they're gonna back out now so safe plays all, all around the viking redemption echo though in the mid lane they didn't even get the oh they didn't even get the puck and they're gonna get the counter kill it seems with the creeps okay so it's like <laughs> what a play are. They're on par with their creeps. I think they uh, paid them a little extra. So, what the heck hey, was yeah. that? You see the echo <laughs> slam on in. Oh, great play. The, the reaction for the puck was wonderful. Absolutely. So they're going to try and jump on to any of these heroes, though. No? Just for harassment. Okay. It also is, it's worth mentioning in that fight there, as we do see the charge broken off, that the Queen of Pain revealed the Orchid on top of the Ember Spirit and was almost able to get the kill, but he gets away on just uh, under 100 HP as he was just able to remnant out at the last second. Not quite enough damage as they needed to rotate one more hero for that. And that's the other thing, is that if you're charging into the mid lane and trying to coordinate your gank onto Puck, and then you simultaneously are charging in down the bottom lane like you're sort of spreading out your ganking potential a little bit too much there that was the reveal of the blink dagger and the orchid um actually it might not have been considering there was this really well placed ward over here to the side so all in all i think for you know mvp maybe a little bit of a miscommunication maybe some nerves coming at them this is an elimination game for them i, I would be a little bit scared too I think so as well. They are going to try and go for a smoke in the meantime as they've got three heroes smoked up. Going to be going into the enemy jungle. Now remember, there's no Echo Slam on the Earth Shaker, so he's going to have to rely completely on a Fissure initiation unless you want to try and go for an Enchant Totem initiation. So they're going to try and look for somebody. They see one, they see two. Who they want to go for is right under the tusk, but the wind just curses. They're going to keep them in place. Queen of Pain in the meantime. Just going to slowly hit on the target, but here comes DDZ. One hero is gone. It's the Earth Shaker. Then it's also going to be the ultimate from the puck, keeping two in place. And it looks like these two are just going to completely melt. Mech or no mech, there was also too much damage regardless. So three heroes go down for MVP. What was supposed to be a smoke gank ended up being a smoke ganked. And now he, okay, I don't know where he came from, but he's gonna be wishing he wasn't here. He's gonna pop the grave, has a TP. There's no disables. Oh, never mind, there is. He's gone. GG. Oh, that was, that was questionable. Um, <laughs> you, you take a look at a few different moments there. Like, you decide to go on and gank, as you mentioned, without the Echo Slam, but also without the Sonic Wave. Sonic Wave was down for another 60 seconds when that team fight started. I think they're expecting to just find one hero. And then you also get into a situation where Queen of Pain, like the fight ends up happening, you know, two heroes are over here in, in this side of the map. You've also got, you know, another couple of heroes that are uh, the Queen of Pain down here on the other side as I take a look about that orchid down on top of the tusk and then the dazzle comes in from behind to try and save somebody but he's not in range for a grave and just gets caught out by the tusk it was all in all just a very strange collection of plays and um I, I think the team redemption at this point are just playing on another level like we saw it at the start of the game if you looked at the cs at the start it was the first two waves were entirely puck they do end up getting the silence down on top of him but he's just going to be able to blink away from that no damage coming in and he is able to make it his way out of there so continuing to commit these spells and abilities and generally time chasing away this very elusive hero, DDZ's been playing it masterfully. Absolutely. And the game is slowly getting out of MVP's grasp. They had a really good early game. They had a couple of items necessary to go for the push and you would, think, would you say 20 minutes right now is their timing window? Because they're not looking that strong anymore because they lost a couple of those, uh, a couple of those team fights. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, the Yasha first also on the Ember Spirit is to get the Manta. There's the Yule Scepter on up. So much damage coming out. It does look like they're going to be able to take out the Ancient Apparition. Winter's Curse at the last second, keeping him alive. They all oh, get silence on the Queen of Pain before the Sonic Wave. They end up throwing out the Winter's Curse. She is finally going to be able to throw it, but it is able to be phase shift by the Puck. He's not going down there. Lance is still taking a lot of damage from Aggressive off to the side. That's actually Febby. DDZ is going to be able to make his way out of here, jaunting away like it ain't no thing. Viper 
ends up taking out the tusk, so a bit of a turnaround, but still, you lost the Queen of Pain in that engagement, and just look at DDZ tear these heroes apart, there's no way for them to be able to have any type of hit. Oh, Bash, one time, Ethereal, there's gonna be the sleight of fist, taking him down, and Puck, again, this hero, 6 and 1 and 9, 20 HP is what he gets away on. Oh my god, that was just such a horrible turn of events for MVP. I'm surprised they did try to go for that sort of initiation onto Puck though, because they openly charged into that Puck. Got heals. Was it supposed to be some sort of a bait? Was it supposed to draw Team Redemption into a particular position? It was a very interesting decision to go for an initiation like that. They don't even have wards in the back lines. They've got one here, which is okay, but you need the wards around this vicinity to see where the heroes are, so they went in blind. Uh, it, tower is under I think maybe you chalk this one up to a bit of a miscommunication on occasion. They're going to jump forward on the Puck thought that he was charging onto him, but that's not going to be the case. Um, and now Puck might even think about jumping on top of the Spear Breaker in return. This BKB on the on the uh, the Viper is this one of those sort of that people talk about occasionally game losing items where you're, you're just sort of going to try and lose a little bit more gracefully? Do you think that this is really the way that you want to go on the Viper? Well. Take a look at what a BKB is going to be providing a Viper. What is it? What's it doing a Viper? It keeps him alive, which is great. You have a hero that's going to survive a little bit longer, or he's not going to die as quickly. But what does Viper do in the middle of the team fights, right? He pops a mech, and that's about it. He doesn't have the best damage output. Dazzle just gets completely melted by DDZ in the meantime. They do try and go for a counter kill, and I think he's going to get caught out here, unfortunately. Silenced up. They do find a mega kill streak. Not as big as I thought it would have been, but uh, I think still a bit of a win there for MVP. But the, doesn't matter if the Viper dies quickly or if he dies not so quickly. He doesn't do anything in Radiant's these fights. There's just that mech. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. And obviously staying alive and being able to soak up damage is going to be pretty important, but they don't have a reason to focus him either. So, like, obviously Nether Toxin is always going to be relevant, but that only kicks in once you start dealing a lot of damage. They need to have, like, the perfect initiation of an Echo Slam into Sonic Wave, and then Viper's damage really starts to be able to come into spades. But until that point, he's not really doing as much as you would hope, and you don't even necessarily have to focus him. So... I, I, I just, I'm not sure about it. It feels a little bit clunky. They do end up jumping forward. It's going to be able to snowball on top of Febby. That's going to be a fissure back the other direction. So maybe going to try and turn this initiation over. But they have Winter's Curse. They can commit if they want to. Nice little Sonic Wave coming out as well. Still staying alive throughout all of it. Finally, the Spirit Breaker, excuse me, the Tusk does go down. Echo Slam on top of the Winter Wyvern. Getting a little bit sloppy here. Doctor jumping forward. It's going to be this Viper slowly moving his way into there with the Spear Breaker charging in again. I think that this could be an opportunity for them to turn this back around if they want. And suddenly, MVP Hot 6 starting to look pretty good. Oh, nice little sleight of fist, though, keeping them at bay. And the disengage is still happening. And it looks like Team Redemption are going to be able to get out of here, only losing one. And I think at that point, for them just to lose one is the best scenario that they could have asked for. If you lose one like that, he was in such a bad position, there was no way to salvage it anyway. So Redemption, they let their hero die. They might lose a T2 in the processor, but DDZ sitting in the tree line. He's ready for an initiation, and as well as the Dream Coil, it's all cooldown. I don't think MVP's going to be ready for his positioning, but they are spreading out. And look at their positioning. They're moving all the way to the west, knowing that there could be a jump in from the side. Yeah, this is exactly what you need to do. Jumping in for another one, though, and the Dazzle trying to keep his creep alive. They do end up hitting the chains onto two. There's going to be a Dream Coil only onto one, but Earthshaker is the guy who's going to end up going out at the very start of this one. Focusing their attention on the Ancient Apparition yet again. He's staying alive through this Winter's Curse, Cold Embrace, everything. Being able to be connected, but finally we're going to see the Spirit Breaker and the Earthshaker fall. Doctor now getting chased down also. It does look like Queen of Pain dies off to the side there to the Tusk Knight's Ice Shards to finish that one off, and they kill off the Viper as well. Finally, every Everybody goes down, looking for another one now. They're going to chase after Heen. This is going to be a full team wipe in just a second or two. What's a Dazzle to do? They do have the Yule Scepter if they have to commit it, but wanting to make sure that they don't if they don't need to. There's the lift. That's a lot of damage coming out with those creeps. Silence comes in. There's going to be the Ember Spirit. Raid Boss is here. One more right click. And DDZ, he's just going to be happy as a clam walking away from these dudes. And MVP, they, they can just sit there and weep. They can't do anything. They tried to take an objective. They got the tower, which is great. You lose your entire trust for the tower. And that all of a sudden, it turns that tower push scenario into more of a team wipe scenario. We kind of lost everything scenario. And if you're watching the Viper in that fight, you saw Pop his BKB. He was hitting a couple of heroes. Nice. That's cool. Doing a little bit of damage. But then what else did he do? 
It really yeah. just didn't do anything outside of it. He even used, the, he waited to use the mech right before he died. He never used it when his allies were low. So th it's been mostly a, a solo mech this game. Well, yeah, and I, I like, we saw there also, he was focusing so heavy on trying to take out that ancient apparition at the start of the fight. He was just right clicking him away. But if you look at Viper's kit, nether toxin physical damage. You've also got obviously a little bit of magical damage coming out from poison attack as well as Viper Strike. But if Winter Wyvern's able to get that cold embrace level three, five percent health regen per second, incredibly powerful. And I think that it really goes to show that if you have these heroes that are single target focused, the power of Winter Wyvern in terms of keeping them alive, and even if it wasn't necessarily able to get off all of his spells on that Ancient Apparition, just soaking up all of that sustained focus by the Viper becomes all the more important because that's damage that's now not being dealt onto the Ember Spirit, damage that's not being dealt onto the Puck, and they're able to just sort of run ham across the whole rest of the game. So I, I think that it, it really is a situation where maybe a bit of not understanding where they need to focus their attention in the team fights. Of course, these players are significantly better than Dota than us, um, but it, it's hard in the middle of a team fight to be able to make those distinctions and very easy to talk about it after the fact when you're just sort of um, not playing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But for MVP though, they keep trying to team fight. They always want, to, they're always hoping that, maybe they're hoping that once just once they'll win a team fight over Team Redemption. But I think at this point it's just, the timing window is gone. They need to change their plan, but because they've drafted these sort of heroes, they don't have many options left. They don't split push as a semi option because they have a Queen of Pain and I guess Spirit Break to a certain to a certain extent. They could try and just go for, I don't know, might just have to go for that pseudo rare around gank that one hero. Hope, hopefully they kill enough heroes to take objectives, but for MVP, there's just nothing really left in the tank for them. They're, they're running out of options. They're running out of time. I don't think they have time left, actually. Oh, uh, Queen of Pain just getting silenced, getting played with a little bit here by DDZ. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll take a look real quickly at the net worth graph. 4,000, that's something that doesn't seem insurmountable, but the thing that you're not seeing in that graph necessarily is the heroes and how well they scale. Winter Wyvern, probably the best scaling defensive support in the game. I would say almost even more so than Dazzle, just because of the, the ulti and what you're able to do with that spell. Uh, also, I mean, Arctic Burn becomes pretty relevant in the late game because it's, you know, percentage based, uh, the amount of health damage that it does. Uh, you take a look at Ember Spirit, probably one of the more hard carries in the game, uh, particularly when there isn't another great one on the side of MVP Hot 6. And Earthshaker, sure, he's going to be able to turn the tide of a team fight, but that mainly comes off the back of bad positioning by your opponents. So if you're not sort of playing incorrectly in Team Redemption's way here, they're in a position to take it. Of course, <laughs> there have been bigger throws in the history of Dota 2, and I feel a little bit bad talking about that given the teams that are in this one, but regardless, um, I, I, I do think that there's a very real possibility here that Team Redemption just take this to the late game and uh, dominate over MVP Hot 6. I think they could just take it to the late game right now. Yeah. They, 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 don't, they don't really have to worry too much about MVP. That they, can keep t they can keep counter team fighting, that's fine. They don't have to force the issues because they're not really forced into that sort of position. They're not sitting on a timing window. They've got yeah. the, later, the later draft, as, as you said. So Team Redemption... Just keep doing what you're doing, whereas for MVP, they, they need to find that opening. They need to find that crack in the Team Redemption's shield, but I don't see it. Well, I really don't. You just picked up three BKBs. You have three BKBs now on the side of MVP, and you're about to be able to get the Aghanim Scepter up on the puck, which pierces that. We are going to see an initiation here on top of Lance. That's going to be a whole heck of a lot of damage, but the cold and blaze and the Glimmer Cape keeping him alive. They're not going to be able to take him down in this one. Viper Strike is on top of this Tusk, but he's still staying alive. The Guardian Greaves is going to be there as well, and all of a sudden you commit so much into this fight, and you're not going to be able to get any kills. Winter Wyvern even is going to walk away from this one. Oh god, that is so disheartening. So, all BKBs got blown. They got no kills. They popped their Sonic Wave, which is now going to be on cooldown for another 100 seconds. Uh, could anything else go wrong? Could anything else go wrong? I mean, they could have gotten team wiped, but <laughs> still, it's, it's certainly not what you want to have happen. Um, oh man, what a disheartening team fight. Goodness yeah, gracious. Really, absolutely. So for MVP, what do they do now? They, I don't think they can sit around and continue on farming unless they're hoping that maybe at this point they're saying, hey, we, maybe we can't team fight them anymore. Maybe we have to try and go into a late game scenario, but they don't have the best heroes for that. They might have to take the risk though, because they can keep on trying to team fight, 
but it's gonna be the exact same story every single time. It's, it's never changed, and it looks like the poor doctor is gonna be quite out, gonna be completely isolated because of that vision. Unfortunately, they will get the catch on the key, so there's gonna be no grave from our dazzle. They lose the earth shaker, and all of a sudden, Queen of Pain's isolated. She gets out in the meantime. So I'm still gonna try and hoof it out of there, but she get yeah. caught with the eels, blocked out, pops the baby, has to get out. Oh, it's dream calls on cooldown. Never mind. Doctor gonna try and man fight this, doing a lot of damage actually to the task. He's actually surviving quite a bit. Gonna try and man fight this a little bit more, but here comes the damage. And Doctor gonna be sent back to the hospital where he came from. Is team Redemption? They lose nobody. And MVP again. They get caught out and chopped up into little sushi pieces. Oh, it's so frustrating. Um, like you saw there also the bait by the Winter Wyvern. It was waiting for the Tusk to get lower and lower, and then all of a sudden you drop on down Radiant the Cold Embrace and the Glimmer Cape, and suddenly you have 60, or what is that, 45% Glimmer magic resistance on top of the complete and total Radiant immunity from physical damage. You're not taking any damage, and you're healing on the back of it, percentage-based healing. So, oh, Echo Slam, maybe of Dreams. Is it gonna be able to be enough, though? Oh, he just snowballs save on top of the Cold Embrace. Sonic Wave is not going to be able to kill him off. They are gonna jump down on top of the Winter Wyvern, who looks to maybe finally go down in the end. That is going to be a bit of a turnaround. Is not going to have a Winter's Curse out, and they do get one kill, but is it enough? It doesn't quite look like it. They're jumping forward now on top of the Tusk, but the Snowball forward away from them. He's going to go onto the Spirit Breaker. Lance is in the middle of everybody. They end up taking out the Earthshaker, and Cold Embrace or not, it's looking like they're going to be in a very, very strong position. The Shallow Grave was out to try and keep that Queen of Pain alive, but one Slight of Fist from the Ember was going to be enough to get that kill, and they take the Tier 2 Tower, as well as two kills of their own. Very surprised that Team, Rede Team Redemption doesn't consider pushing down through that mid lane because the fight happened in in this vicinity. So if you're that close to the enemy base, then you probably consider trying to go for a push, but they just backed off. Very passive play for Team Redemption. If there's no action, they just go back to their lanes. Well, and it doesn't feel to me like they're necessarily having trouble closing it out. They're just being very careful. Like, they're being super careful about their initiations, not wanting to give a potential for them to, you know, lose this game. They've got the Aghanim Scepter up on the Ancient Apparition. We've said it multiple times. There's no rush for them. So I, I'm completely and totally happy with this play to make sure that they're fighting every single engagement correctly. And it, it almost feels like the one thing that they could probably get pretty soon would be some form of minus armor to be able to take Roche, because that's the downside side to Team Redemption's lineup right here is that they don't have the best Roche taking lineup. They don't have somebody who's going to be that big massive damage dealer. Tusk ended up going for more survivability build here. He's got the Blink Dagger and the Guardian Greaves to be able to purge away stuff as well as jump on in with the Snowball. Um, for the Ember Spirit, he is now going for the crit, but it's still a little ways away and they don't really have any minus armor to be able to sort of take Roshan any easier. They could just pick up a medallion if they wanted that cheap cost efficient uh, armor reduction because the only other hero I could really see oh, picking up is. the Edesso. Okay, so there we go. Cheap medallion and then we're gonna be expecting a Roche very shortly. But I think at this point maybe they're looking for maybe a hero kill before they move into the Roche pit to make it a hundred percent safe. Although then again, MVP's Roche uh, team fight Roche ability is not that strong. Not too much AoE, not too much control. So I think Team Redemption, they can just go in there and feel relatively safe as long as they have that Wyvern outside of the pit. Yeah, definitely. And the counter initiation is strong for Team Redemption also. It looks like at least for the moment they're going to go on down and try and take the top tier 2 tower instead. And then afterwards transition themselves on into picking Roshan. Because I think that that's probably a bit of the safer play as well. You mentioned that they don't have the best team fight lineup, but you imagine an Echo Slam on top of, you know, a Sonic Wave. It can get pretty scary pretty quickly. And there's going to be doing the safe thing. Do toss on out a couple of uh, spells in the area to make sure that they take away the... Uh, vision over there in case somebody is hiding in the jungle and with the DD up on the Ember Spirit I don't see them coming to try and contest this anytime soon about 350 damage a pop on top of the crits that can't come out at any given point in time And yeah, they're just gonna sack this tower and uh, maybe now at this point you feel comfortable going for Roche Or high grounds? The they're, they're hanging around. I think they're gonna back up now. Are they backing up? Yes, they are. So here we go. Backing up. Can TP back slowly We'll see if Redemption feels like doing Roche because it just feels like at the at the at this point it's just them kind of deciding when they feel like they want to do things. Yeah, definitely. There's there's no rush. There's no um, it, playing much more by feel as you mentioned there. And Battle Fury up on the Ember Spirit. I don't think there's a game where he has to go for a second Battle Fury. I, I think that probably 
Uh, I don't know if Lincoln's is necessary either. It doesn't feel like he needs more survivability items because there aren't great ways to catch him. Like, if he wanted to never die again, then I think that probably Lincoln's is the way to go. But I also feel like he could go for more damage if he wanted to and just ensure that scalability. So maybe a second Daedalus at some point in time? or I don't even know if we're going to get to that point, honestly. It, it's looking like this could be over in 15 minutes unless you see some type of miraculous comeback by MVV Hot 6, which, I mean, I would love to be able to see us go to a game three here. I would as well, but it depends if they're going to be able to execute that correctly. Right. So, Aegis is going to be going in the Ember Spirit, of course, so he's able to go a little bit more balls deep with this high ground push and be a little bit more aggressive in his positioning. We have the rest of MVP, though, moving up to, uh, together up towards the north. Going into the enemy jungle, no one's in there, but I think if they do find a hero in the jungle, it would be more or less a bonus, but it's barren. No one's here. No one wants to farm. No one wants to make something happen. Yeah, Refresher now picked up on Puck. This is an item that we often see. I, I think that normally you end up seeing instead the Hex, but given how many BKBs are on the side of uh, MVP Hot 6, and given also the sort of ability to get the Sleight of Fists down on top of almost the whole area of wherever you end up throwing out that Dream Quail, this seems very strong to me. And you take a look at the Dream Quail duration. So the duration on it is eight seconds when you end up getting the Scepter. And it's a 4.5 second stun that goes through BKB. This is ridiculous. It's an incredible disable. And maybe now, actually, I, I think that probably going for a second Daedalus might be the way Radiant's to go, just based off of how much attack. sort of uh, damage the Ember Spirit is going to be able to do in those small areas with the Dream Quail down. Yeah, I don't see why not. He can go for the second Daedalus, or if he really wants to, he also has the option of maybe going for a Scardi, mm. which means that any targets that he hit, obviously they're going to be slowed up, Dyer's and that means that the MVP, if they fight and they get hit by Lance, Radiant's they have to commit. They're not going to be able to retreat. Yeah. Definitely, and trade in towers at this point in time seems good for uh, MVP Hot 6, and charging on over into the mid lane is just going to be able to push out these a little bit further, so perfectly fine there, but now maybe in a little bit of trouble, we'll see if they end up catching out this Queen of Pain here. Don't want to end up blowing a Dream Quail on it, but the silence looks to be able to be enough, as he just has end up ethereal jaunting back, because why not? You can just play with them at this point. Like, to me, that's just like, I don't care what you're going to do to me. I'm just going to be up in your face and messing with you. Mm. So we're going to have a gem picked up actually on the Earth Shaker. So they will have the, the true site to work with, but there's, they're stuck in their base. It's not really going to be too useful, but they will be hanging around on the high ground. Whereas the Team Redemption, would you would they just slow siege this or do they have to try and go for a quick push? Because they're still running on an Aegis timing. So they've only got a small portion of time to work with. Yeah, I think that it wouldn't be terrible for them to go for a pretty quick one, and it looks like they're actually going to be doing that, setting the puck up. The uh, illusory orb is off cooldown another couple of seconds, and seeing nobody here, it might feel comfortable just pushing on up into the middle of all of this. Obviously, you do have the possibility to jump forward and deal a lot of damage with an Echo Slam if you're not careful. Nice sleight of fist, creating that little bit of extra damage on top of these heroes, bringing them slightly lower, and a cold embrace up is going to mean that they're going to be able to jump in again with a second run. There's actually going to be the initiation. DDZ could be in a little bit of trouble. There's the Dream Quail on top of them. A Blast is coming in. It's going to apply the debuff onto Doctor. Winter's Curse committed as well, but so much damage. I don't think the Doctor has enough. Echo Slam onto three. This might be the initiation that they need. They end up taking out two of them. The Aegis has burned through also a second Dream Quill now, but Ember Spirit is back in the middle of all of them. And just look at the crits come in. He's moving around every which way. That is going to break the stun. Oh, aggressive. The Febby, he's going to get out of there. Now the reinitiation by the Spirit Breaker. He's on top of DDZ. We do have another phase shift, which is going to keep him alive a little bit longer. Refresher has already already been committed and that was a pretty great team fight for MVP Hot 6. That was, that was probably the best team fight that they could have asked for and that was off the back of a very nice Echo Slam. The Fissure keeping them in place once they clumped up around the Dazzle and then after that it was just MVP raining hell on the Team Redemption. Unfortunately it wasn't on the major cause. Hmm. They got rid of the Aegis which was, which was nice but you're not killing off these heroes and Lance has just bought Boots of Travel so be throwing away his uh, power treads shortly, I presume, but that's the high ground push for Team Redemption cut short because of that team fight. And I suppose high ground is still a factor for MVP, even though they're not running a draft that has too much damage, they still have that oomph because Team Redemption, you look at their heroes, they're not in particular that tanky. Yeah.
No, it's definitely true. And I mean, that was what we were talking about there, that they needed to be careful about the sort of all out burst damage that comes from the side of MVP Hot 6. And I think maybe after playing it so carefully for a little while, they just got a little bit over ambitious. I think the puck uh, being up there was in a bit of trouble, but um, and, and the fact that he had to sort of blow the original Dream Coil early definitely not what you wanted to have happen so all in all probably not the best but i don't think that this means by any stretch of the imagination that they're going to be able to be out of this game at all bkb has been popped now walrus punch committed that's going to break through it and all of a sudden your tusk or excuse me spirit breaker ends up going down and now looking to try and force the issue a little bit further and i don't see why not just kill these heroes but if there are heroes down then just go for the push or at least just make something happen take objectives push the game forward and for redemption they're not in a rush, so if they get hero kills, it's, it's literally a bonus to go for push. That's really, that's really all it is. I really would have rather seen right there um, the Ember Spirit go back to try and defend, because then he could have remnant it back. But now we have the reinitiation. Earthshaker is here. He's going to get caught out a little bit. They end up cheap sticking him up one time. We do have the Cold Embrace as well, the Glimmer Cake, keeping him alive. A Blast going to connect onto two. Sonic Wave now committed, but he's still alive to all of its all. There's the Echo Slam, a second one to be able to be a pretty solid pickoff, but in the middle of all of it, you're a wicked six streak on the Ember Spirit, still alive throughout all of this. Heen is going to get Yule Sceptered on up. I think he dies in a second or two. Still here is going to be doing a lot of damage onto the AA. And it looks like finally the Viper might be able to do enough to start really scaling well into this game. DDZ is still alive as is Lance, but I don't know if they have enough control at this point to continue this push. Another pickoff here and a solid team fight by MVP Hot 6 defending their high ground. And then we actually have the Spirit Breaker coming in. He actually connects, oh, what is, you see his model just bugged out into the ground? What in the world? That was weird. You, do you see it? Um, I see Spirit Breaker actually doing like, I don't know what he is doing. He's actually over here by the creep wave, but it looks all kinds of weird. He's like digging for dirt or something. <laughs> um, I don't know what's going on. Um, but regardless, hopefully it stays like that throughout the whole rest of this cast. That's what happens when you end up getting an Ember Spirit changing you while you're charging on in. Uh, his forehead is just plastered into the ground. He's a face farming. Considering what's happened, unfortunately. Bit of pain, though. Just Doesn't able get to get caught. out. Yeah, the blink away, and then she was able to just TP. I think that the Dream Quail came a second too late, and it wasn't able to catch her. But still do have the Refresher on up. But MVP Hot 6, despite the fact that we were ruling them out of this game in the late stages, they're putting on a pretty good show. And it feels like the execution has been there. Um, in terms of what they've needed to do in these team fights, they haven't been able to burst on down the Viper, and he's really starting to get more tanky. I I just think that maybe Team Redemption need to play this a little bit differently at this point, possibly doing some split pushing. What are your thoughts? They can go for the split push. I think it's just the main issue for them is that because they've been pushing high ground, it's been a massive advantage for MVP because high ground yeah. is obviously going to be an advantage to the defending team. So. The MVP, it's just a saving grace that the fact that for them having high ground, meaning that the Echo Slam is going to come out a little bit, a little bit nicer for them, and also for Team Redemption, they're going into enemy territory, and also buybacks are a factor. So obviously, if there's a buyback, the hero is going to come back into the fight almost instantly. So you also have to take into consideration of that. It's just high ground defense. If the fight is in the middle of the map, if it's on the side of Team Redemption, then it completely tips on its head, and then Team Redemption are going to be the ones in a very good position. So it's just mostly been the high ground that's been a problem here for them. If they can break high ground, then I think Redemption have got this game. Oh, this is actually a huge play right now. They ended up bringing the puck in, smoked up, and he's going to be behind the Tier 3 tower as we see everybody move on in from Team Redemption to be in this area. MVP Hot 6 trying to defend as long as possible. Nice blink on back. Ember Spirit keeping them alive a little bit longer. The offensive weave is going to keep them a little bit longer afraid of moving forward. And there's the Ember Spirit going to be clearing out the top creep wave or bottom creep wave ladder. Actually, everybody's in the middle of them. There's going to be a huge Dream Quail going to be connecting onto four, I do believe. Dr. Drop really low. Nice scrape keeping them alive. Snowball forward. Sonic Wave is going to be connected, but only onto Lance. Double kill for him. Two heroes are dead. Buybacks immediately across the board, but that goes slam. It is absolutely enormous. I think that that might have been enough to at least dissuade Team Redemption moving any further forward they are going to be able to jump forward now on the queen of pain can they find this kill walrus punch forward and it looks like they might have overcommitted at this point oh puck making his presence felt and i think doctor could go down as well if they're able to get that shards up that's pretty 
be good. Buy back on the Amber Spirit. They smell blood. They want to go for the finish. He's TP booting in. They need to kill off that creep, but not going to be able to make it happen. So much catch on the side of Team Redemption here as they end up getting the shards one more time. Doctor dropping low. Is he going to be able to get out? Nice Glimmer Cape keeping him alive, but still no towers are down, and they need to make this sound very quickly before anybody else comes up. Huge win, though, for Team Redemption. 80 second um, cooldown on the Queen of Pain, though, so I think at this point, they're, they're, safe to sa they're safe to take that top set of racks, it's fine. They've taken one set of objectives. The risk comes if they try and take either a mid or a bottom set of racks, but they're going to continue on just taking these racks. What's the decision? They're going to come in with the Earth Shaker. That's why questionable and pick aggressive gonna lose his life. He's got buyback available. He will pop it though. The team fight's gonna come back through as they wanna try and defend. Can they actually keep these racks alive? They're very low. The illusions are still chewing into them. And MVP, their attention, it's split. They're trying to focus heroes down, but they can't quite kill them off. They will get one kill at least on the ancient apparition, but one rax is down. Second one will go down shortly. Spirit break is gone down. He's got no buyback. Both raxes are gone. Objective has been taken. Mission successful and team redemption are gone. Oh, really well played there across the board. You did also see in the middle of that team fight, Viper was trying to take on out the Ancient Apparition, but the Glimmer Capes were going off all over the place. They are able to keep him alive. He threw out the AA Blast, and that was going to be enough to make sure that the kill ended up coming out. So really well played across the board. Buyback status is really <laughs> going to be hurting at this point for the Radiant. Only the Dazzle has it, and he is not in a position to really have any type of impact in these team fights beyond a Shallow Grave. And now with Roshan back up, they're going to be comfortable to take this. What position or what ability for MVP Hot six do you have to defend this i actually realize this is going on this could be big with the echo slam there's a possibility here and i don't think team redemption will be expecting this is there a smoke they need a smoke because it's a high ground wall they know this is here they will get the water GDG, he spots around everyone they're just are they going to keep on going for the roach it's risky oh but they're not pumped up Oh. That could have been huge. That would have been the moment. And unfortunately, the Earthshaker ends up showing it off. Dream Quill now committed. They're going to start to tear him up. We got the Illusory Orb coming on in. Heen is in the middle of them. Sonic Wave comes out. There's going to be the A Blast. It does apply the debuff onto three of them. And now needing to run away from this one. There's the Snowball in the blink away. Heen's still dropping low. He's going to end up going down. Ethereal Jaunt could come in a second. Actually, he's able to juke on out the Queen of Pain there, but might end up being able to get lifted up in the Yule Scepter. That is going to be the Tusk finally falling off to the side. The Puck and the Queen of Pain battle is going to come out victorious for the Puck as he ends up just being able to waste her time. Jumps into the middle of the team fight. Spear Breaker goes down. Doctor's here also. And so much time was wasted there. The Queen of Pain, she wasn't able to get out the damage that she needed. Oh, God. This game is an absolute disaster for MVP. If they... Did they have the smoke? Did they have the smoke? I'm not sure if they did. They did end up smoking up after the fact and GG ends up getting called. It felt to me like there was an option there. If they smoked in, I think that would have been the opportunity, but because they didn't smoke in and he revealed himself to kill off a ward, that blew their cup. Oh gosh. What a game. Yep, well, we do end up seeing Team Redemption take it in a 2-0 series. Very convincing, both games. I felt like their draft, their execution was really solid. Um, Danny, any other thoughts before we end up moving on? Uh, I'm... Honestly, I'm incredibly impressed with Team Redemption's comeback. They've played superbly. They have drafted phenomenal drafts. They've made everything work. They know the synergy is there. You, you watch this team, and you, they know what they're doing. You can see their movements. They have decisive team play. It is amazing. I'm actually hoping to see more Team Redemption. I really am. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure casting for you all. We hope you stick around for our second series of the day, which is going to be taking place, I believe, in just...